Hello! 1994 saw the advent of a revolutionary new fighting game called Tekken, which has since grown to become a household name alongside the likes of Street Fighter, and has superseded predecessors of the market such as Mortal Kombat, Toshinden, Dead or Alive and Virtual Fighter. And at the heart of this franchise is perhaps one of the most complex characters we've seen in the fighting game genre to date, and the subject of today's character study, Kazuya Mishima. Now, at a glance, and particularly at the time of Tekken's debut, Kazuya might have seemed cut from the same generic cloth as other fighting game protagonists. A simple white attire aligns him with the likes of Ryu from Street Fighter or Akira Yuki from Virtual Fighter, but one of the revelatory factors that sets Tekken apart from these peers is how Kazuya progressed to become far from the clean-cut or simplistic hero in his narrative background and later story trajectory. Indeed, Tekken 1's instruction manual details how Kazuya has entered the tournament intent on revenge against his father, who cast him off a cliff as a child, and to assume control of his father's company, the Mishima Zaibotsu. We later learn from the context offered in Tekken 7 that Kazuya was doubly vengeful towards his father, not just for the slight against himself, but also Heihachi's murder of Kazumi, Kazuya's mother. And it's in this narrative foundation that makes Kazuya so interesting as a hero anti-hero and eventual villain of the Tekken franchise. He's at the centre of a Shakespearean tragedy of a story arc, and much like Shakespeare's Hamlet, who is displaced after his uncle murders his father and assumes con control of the Dutch kingdom, so too is Kazuya displaced after his father murders his mother and casts him aside to his assumed death. And much like Hamlet, who is ultimately driven by the desire for revenge against his uncle and by murdering his uncle, so too is Kazuya's raison d'etre, the prospect of revenge against Heihachi and assuming his rightful place as the leader of the Zaibotsu for pretty much the entirety of the Tekken storyline. And interestingly, similar revenge plays such as The Revenger's Tragedy follows this narrative arc um, and sees a young man being deplaced by a murderous, usurping older force and putting them on an irrevocable path towards vengeance and... I feel there's really strong parallels to draw here from this medium uh, that applied to Kazuya too. Furthermore, and still looking at references to classical literature, we have the stereotype of the deal with the devil and this kind of pact with the devil. And between Tekken's 1 and 2 in particular, there's some real correlations here with Thomas Kidd's play, The Spanish Tragedy, which sees the ghost of the recently murdered Don Andrea make a pact with the personified character of Re Revenge, who then leads him back to the realms of the living, so that he might exact this vengeance on those that wronged him. And we also have the far more renowned tale of Faust, who is a doctor who makes a deal with the demon Mephistopheles, so that he might attain all the knowledge in the universe. And... Both of these examples draw parallels with Kazuya's storyline, particularly in the 1998 anime uh, Tekken the Motion Picture, which is set roughly between the events of Tekken 1 and 2, and shows him making a pact with the devil so that he might survive the fall from the cliff and murder Heihachi. But on that note, and it's prudent to mention, I think this has since been retconned, because from Tekken 4 onwards, the devil aspect of the storyline and of Kazuya's personality has been confirmed as a biological trait, a hereditary trait, rather than an external force that Kazuya has bargained with. But regardless, there's still this strong thread of moral degradation and irrevocable corruption that makes Kazuya change from this apparent protagonist and hero status that he has in Tekken 1 to an outright villain in Tekken 2, and eventually this kind of murky grey character from Tekken 4 onwards, which I'll, I'll discuss shortly. Now, just digressing quickly in terms of moveset, Kazuya, along with Heihachi, are both described as practitioners of Mishima-style karate, and this sees a balance of power and fluidity that can be closely asso associated with the real-life style of Shotokan karate, and I think this is best glimpsed in their respective stances, which sees their legs planted wide, you know, allowing for strong punches and hip movements, which Shotokan karate accentuates and uh, promotes quite heavily. And this is particularly re uh, prevalent when looking at Heihachi, as there's also the recurring motif of the tiger on 
Heihachi's outfits and also sometimes in his stages, which is the official symbol of Shotokan Karate as well. So, turning to first attack and one, we see the blueprint for Kazuya's fighting style, which would go on to be fine-tuned in later installments, but there's a good balance of manoeuvres that lean towards strong punching combos here, and again, like every other character in these early days, we saw his moveset being quite limited, but there was enough to make him interesting and distinguish him from other characters in the roster as well, I think. In terms of aesthetics, uh, Kazuya was shirtless in Tekken 1 with red sparring gloves and torn up trousers, and these prevail as one of his uh, pr primary outfits um, right through to today, although he has the addition of some flame patterns on his, his current outfits. His second outfit in Tekken 1 was a more casual denim vest combo, which conveys a sort of down-and-out lone wanderer image of him uh, having been displaced from his home and his fortune, you know, obviously in the events of his childhood. So there's some kind of narrative conveyed in his outfits as well, which later... Uh, I'll get on to Tekken 2, but we see this kind of transition when he attains the wealth of the Zaibotsu and has this kind of purple tuxedo that he starts wearing instead. So, in terms of story, Kazuya comes to Tekken 1 very much in the guise of a hero, or at least an anti-hero. He adorns the cover art and is clearly positioned here as the primary protagonist, and Heihachi, by comparison, is cast as the evil and ominous antagonist that we only meet once we get to the final stage. However, it's clear even in these early days that the Tekken scenario writers knew where this story was going to be heading because, of course, the devil character palette was available for Kazuya as a secret, unlockable attire. And as the canonical ending video in Tekken 1, Kazuya manages to despatch Heihachi and assume control of the Mishima Zaibatsu. And this is how, kind of shifting into Tekken 2 here, we see the second phase of his character arc begin to em emerge, which is that of a villainous dictator. And in the context of the time, in terms of fighting games and games in general, this was really interesting to see, because Tekken 2 saw Heihachi assume the position that his son was in for the first game, and it was almost as bizarre as seeing... You know, the comparison would be seeing M. Bison from Street Fighter somehow becoming the hero, and Ryu somehow becoming the bad guy. But this was the brilliance of Tekken, and this still is the brilliance of Tekken and its kind of ongoing story arc, because we see Kazuya in Tekken 2 as an unlockable final boss, alongside his devil counterpart. Now, interestingly, and just noting back to the Tekken anime and potential retcon of the devil character I mentioned, Kazuya's ending FMV in Tekken 2 sees him physically defeating the devil, which indicates that at least early on, perhaps, the devil character was intended to be a external force that Kazuya had bargained with in this pursuit of revenge. But again, you know, it seems to have become an eventual genetic bloodline thing rather than a, an external being in, in later games. So again, I'm, I'm not 100% sure whether this is canon storyline, um, but again, we, we've seen the devil as an external force, but later kind of ingrained as an aspect of Kazuya's um, character and genetic makeup. Now, just noting back to Kazuya as a tragic figure, we see this tragic storyline and this tragic demeanour develop through his aesthetics and stage in Tekken 2 too. And he's wearing this purple suit, indicating that he's, you know, attained his wealth and position finally. And his stage is a grand, sprawling, carpeted hall that we can probably assume is the penthouse office of the Zaibatsu or some equivalent thing like that. But more pressingly, I think Tekken 2 conveys this moral downfall and this, this succumbing to the devil and evil um, beautifully by his stage theme, which is called Emotionless Passion. And I've mentioned in earlier videos regarding Tekken that the first three games had the more dramatic edge to them, which later gave way to comedy and slightly more lighter and more ridiculous storylines, particularly with secondary and non-canon endings and characters. Uh, but these closing moments of Tekken 2's arcade mode were perhaps the best example of where the potentially dark storyline and dark direction of this series, you know, embodied by Kazuya, um, 
could have could have taken the lead and taken the game off into a much more morally ambiguous and dramatic direction which arguably you know i know some people that have commented on my previous um tekken videos have suggested perhaps it should have gone in now events regarding jun kazama and jin's conception at, at this point in tekken 2 are left largely untouched by namco but Tekken the motion picture, just kind of relating back to that anime, goes some way towards filling in the blanks and posits Jun as a character that strove to see the good in people, and particularly the good in Kazuya, and tr attempted to expel these demonic forces within him. And the movie closes with Kazuya sh saving Jun, and thus fostering this relationship would, which would lead to Jin being born, and later the events of Tekken 3. However, Heihachi's defeat of Kazuya, which is the canonical ending of Tekken 2 and is responsible for Kazuya's absence in Tekken 3, leaves the particulars of the storyline and the chronology of this situation quite unexplained. But suffice it to say, Kazuya is absent from Tekken 3 because Heihachi's thrown him into a volcano. And it's not until sometime later when G Corp uh, eventually recover him that Kazuya is revived and capable of controlling these demonic powers, which leads into Tekken 4. Now, Tekken 4 opens with quite an action-packed re resumption of Kazuya in the story, as we see him, you know, kind of surviving an assassination attempt, and quite out of character for him, we see him holding a firearm, which, interestingly, he doesn't actually use while he's taking out these Tekken 4 soldiers. So in terms of the story, he then assumed control of G-Corp, which prevails up into the events of Tekken 7, and he's still kind of jostling for power for both G-Corp and Heihachi Zaibatsu in this kind of dictatorship and world domination that he seems to be striving for here. So with Kazuya resuming his inclusion in Tekken from Tekken 4 onwards, the storyline becomes slightly more convoluted because, of course, we have Jin introduced as a third wheel here, or rather, Kazuya introduced as a third wheel, which had formerly been this Kazuya versus Heihachi feud. But where Kazuya and Heihachi are relatively immoral people, you know, vying for power for entirely selfish megalomaniac reasons, Jin and his inclusion to the series is a very interesting ray of hope sort of character and sort of this delayed protagonist of the series almost, who's just inadvertently cursed with this bloodline from his father. And on this note, I think it was quite wise for them to push Jin and Lars into a secondary storyline, uh, particularly in the events of Tekken 7, because at this point, the Heihachi and Kazuya feud desperately needed some sort of conclusion, you know, in light of all these additional characters being introduced. Now... In terms of commands, uh, Tekken 4 sees Kazuya's moveset being greatly embellished with fluidity of handling and combinations being improved to a massive degree. Much of his current moveset is established here while still retaining the essence of his power punches and you know, these combinations that are established in the first two games. The ending to Tekken 4 also segues neatly and almost immediately, in fact, into the events of Tekken 5, where we see Kazuya and Heihachi ambushed by Jax at Honmaru. And this event is really neatly replicated and playable in Tekken 7, I might add. And on the note of Tekken 5, actually, uh, Kazuya's ending, although non-canon, speaks volumes about the ongoing degradation and internal conflict of his character. And it's one of the things I really actually liked about Tekken 5. So we see him cradling his dying grandfather, um, Jim Patchy, and while he's doing this, he kind of briefly has flashbacks and reminisces about his childhood, where we see him playing or training with Jim Patchy. And there's this sort of glimpse of innocence that Kazuya once had that we haven't previously seen in the game at all. But interestingly for this ending FMV, it's quickly stifled and pushed aside by this demonic force within him, and he remorselessly executes his grandfather with this jab to the neck, which I think speaks volumes about Kazuya and the trajectory of his character and this ongoing tragedy and conflict of his character. Now, much of Tekken 6 sees Kazuya's attention turned towards his son Jin, and Jin, by this point, has been established as a sort of cursed hero, 
and much like Kazuya, he carries this devil gene around with him, but utilises it towards a greater good, or at least destroying a greater evil. Uh, Kazuya, on the other hand, has come to embody this greater evil, and has, has essentially stepped into the villainous shoes of his father, and it's this kind of ongoing generational cycle where you know the father the son replaces the father and becomes the enemy and it's you know really quite interesting how they do that and the Tekken 6 plot brings not only Jin, Heihachi and Kazuya to the forefront of the story but also Lars and the adopted brother Lee Chao Lan who has previously only featured as a kind of sub-boss material and we also of course have Azazel as the obligatory supernatural element and as such I think and I think many think that Tekken 6 uh, started to lose some of its cohesion around this point and some of its focus. And I think this is probably why Namco wisely opted to focus the entirety of Tekken 7's main story on resolving this increasingly tangent plotline uh, with regards to the Mishima clan. Now, Tekken 7 was great in terms of narrative, particularly when it comes to Kazuya and Heihachi, we see most of the story from Heihachi's perspective as he's shifted into this strange protagonist status. And I actually felt quite sympathetic towards him once the story of Kazumi unfolds. But interestingly, although posited as the main antagonist, the story is not entirely without sympathy for Kazuya either. And one can't help but wonder whether Heihachi's decision to cast Kazuya off the cliff initiated the entire horrible sequence of events that Kazumi had warned him about in the first place. Indeed, just relating back to um, tragedy, and particular Shakespearean tragedy, it's, it reminds me a lot of the play Macbeth, and how at the beginning of the play, three witches visit Macbeth and tell him that he's going to become king. And what this does is prompt a series of events wherein he he and his wife start murdering people and they murder their way up towards the, th the throne and become king and queen which probably wouldn't have otherwise happened if the witches hadn't visited him and told him he was going to be king in the first place so it's got this horrible sort of um, tragic fate kind of attributed to it now until Tekken 7 we'd only read about the events of Kazuya being thrown off the cliff as a child and we also see it take place in the Tekken anime. And in terms of historical context and building the finality of the story, it was a really good decision, I think, by Namco to take this event and put it as a interactive aspect of the game, you know, the game story mode. And we also saw various flashbacks about the cyclical series of events that took place, um, you know, where we have Heihachi and Kazuya throwing each other from high places, basically in an effort to assume control of the Zaibotsu and, you know, the, by extension, the world. And much like Star Wars, I think, Tekken has a strong sense of heritage and lineage with family ties and bloodlines and repeating histories making up the backbone of the core storyline. And again, Tekken 7 is significant because it closes a chapter of this cycle by killing off Heihachi, but also perpetuates another one by allowing Kazuya to assume, once and for all, the role of antagonist, and his son Jin, by extension, you know, assumes the role of the hero. The epilogue sees Lee Cha Lan, Lars, and Jin, who are basically the remainders of the Mishima family, standing together, and it makes this theory seem all the more likely that future instalments are going to see an aging Kazuya edging de deeper into the evil and depravity you know of this of this cursed blood and this this megalomaniac sort of attitude he seems to have adopted now just to note finally on the death of Heihachi which I will likely cover in a Heihachi specific video I felt this was a beautiful and tragic moment with regards to Kazuya because we can tangibly see the conflict taking place within him and at one moment he seems fatigued and teary-eyed, kind of looking at his ancient father in front of him. And he's sort of reminiscing about a time before this downward spiral took place. But it's remarkably short-lived as a moment, and as we see flashes of Heihachi throwing him from the cliff appear once more, he musters this deep-seated hatred and delivers a, 
a killing blow to his father. And I think this is significant, and it's prudent to note just how passionately Kazuya must have felt at this moment, because Heihachi managed to defeat Kazuya in his devil form, you know, his superior supernatural form. But he was ultimately killed by the human form of Kazuya, you know, and it was this hatred that that actually delivered the killing blow to Heihachi rather than, you know, some supernatural strength. And just a final significance to this fight is Kazuya reiterating Heihachi's line, which is, a fight is about who's left standing, nothing else. And Heihachi states this after telling his Kazumi story, and it seems to indicate that family ties and lingering emotions and that sort of thing are there, but they must be pushed aside when it comes right down to the bare bones of this struggle for survival. And it perhaps indicates that Kazuya, you know, in his heart of hearts, deep down, cannot hate his father. But he knows he simply cannot coexist in a world alongside him. And it's almost a catch-22 situation that he has there. So, looking to the future of Tekken 8 and beyond, I think it's likely that Kazuya has shifted firmly from an anti-hero and morally ambiguous character firmly into the role of an antagonist and unless some external force comes along which threatens humanity at large and you know would force Kazuya to be aligned perhaps with you know Jin and people like that I think we can probably assume that he is going to be you know featured as the game's main antagonist uh, for the next couple of installments at least onwards Anyway, thank you for taking the time to listen to this, and if you like my content, please don't forget to subscribe, share, and also feel free to drop me a comment, as I'm always up for discussing these games and these characters that I, that I opt to discuss here. <laughs>